This brother first showed up in our circle at Convergence 2. And if you've ever heard me or any of these brothers say, the age of the lone wolf is over, it's because of this man. Make some noise for Philip Folsom. <laughs> yeah. Love you, Bob. Oh, thank you, sir. Rock it. All right. Hey, before we kick this off, I'd love you just to introduce yourself to your neighbor. Now, let's do our first, middle, and last name. Formal introductions. Both sides. All right. It's nice to have a community of people that feel the need to talk and that feel safe enough to talk to a man that's sitting right next to them. How many of you men got a uh, right handshake in the introduction? Raise your hands. That ritual is one of the universal rituals of mankind, humanity. Every culture and every era and every area has had some form of demonstrating no weapons. So the right handshake, well, we carry our weapons in our right hand. That's why they call them arms. Okay? In desert communities, we throw sand in the air. Uh, even a simple wave is a demonstration of no weapons. How many veterans we got in the crowd? Why don't you stand up? Stand up for us. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And hey, a little, just kind of a, a nudge, because uh, it's nice to honor all of us. Uh, the return of warriors back into society is a core component of healthy masculinity. It's one of the many, many things that we have missed. And we're in a culture where we hire our warriors to do the work. We have outsourced. We have surrendered the sovereignty of that work. And we don't really want to hear about it. And so when we see a veteran, we often just say, thank you for your service. And there's an aspect of dismissal in that. And I'd like to just um, encourage you that the next time you meet a veteran, that you say, welcome home you will see um, a, a profound change in their body and you'll feel it. Yeah, Welcome home. <laughs> Buy them a cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. So in the military, we have a, another ritual of no weapons, which is we salute each other. And that comes from an age old lineage of when we used to wear armor. And when you met another man who was wearing a helmet, you would raise your visor making yourself vulnerable, your most vulnerable parts of your body. And if that other man raised his visor, it meant that you didn't have to fight. It's an incredibly important ritual. And all of those rituals are sourced from a common theme, and that is that we are afraid of each other. Men are afraid of other men. And, we should be. We're the most lethal predator on the planet. Facts. So when we are sitting next to eight inches apart on a bench with another super predator, something's going on in your body, right? You may not acknowledge it in your big prefrontal cortex, but deeper in that gray matter is your amygdala and that's a threat sensing fire alarm in your brain. And its only job is to scan for perceived threats to your physical or emotional well being. Perceived threats. Your collective consciousness about what you feel about men in society and we're safe because we have these norms, that does no good for your amygdala. And your amygdala is saying, 
I'm sitting next to a man that I don't know where he even came from. And it's dumping cortisol, norepinephrine, and adrenaline into your body. And those are defense hormones, right? They're designed to make us fight and flight. It turns off all of our non-essential functions. So our digestion turns off. That delicious taco meal we just had. If you're feeling anxiety around sitting with a stranger who's behind you, might have a knife, who knows? You're not digesting your food right now. Turns off your libido. It turns off your immune system. Turns off your critical thinking. Turns off your compassion. It turns off the risk drivers of being honest, right? Being ambitious, speaking your requirements instead of your requests. That's what cortisol does to us. It just puts all of our energy into fight and flight. And that's the story of men today. So how often are you around men who are strangers to you? How about on your journey getting here? How many strange men did you pass? Thousands. So we're living in that state of constant activation. We're being activated and triggered by our lack of kinship with the men that we're around. And this is gonna be a key theme to this conversation tonight, is how do we reclaim our kinship? It's the big driver of everything. And my name is Philip Mackay Folsom. Uh, I'm a Choctaw heritage. I'm also a, an army veteran, and I'm a consultant for uh, big corporations. So I work with uh, Red Bull and SpaceX and Google, and I lecture down at uh, USC Marshall at their business school. And so I'm gonna be around all evening, and I'm gonna be around all day tomorrow. So if you'd like to uh, pick my brain around anything related to leadership out there in the real world, I'd be very happy to share um, the work that I'm doing in the corporate space, because it's very exciting to see our work being integrated back into the world. I've been waiting for it. Oh. I'm also old enough. Apparently, I'm an elder. That was nice, nice to uh, know. I thought I was blending in really well with you young guys. Like, fuck. I got called out. You, old one in the back. All right. My residual identity is about 35. I really think that I'm a young guy. And it's like, damn, who's that old guy in this video this guy's shooting? Um, so I'm old enough to have experienced the first men's movement. And that's the one with Robert Bly. You know, it's, it's the old, old bulls, you know. And this was, this is back in the, in the 1980s, right? And we all went off on retreats. We all wore feathers. We all did war paint, we all drummed, we all did all these things, right? And we talked about the big game of brotherhood and all of that, and then it died. And it died because it did not integrate a certain aspect of traditional masculinity. That means we were focused on healing. We thought the story ended there. If I can heal, my problems will be solved, and so will my family's problems and the problems of society. And I would like to share with you that healing is just a step to a greater service. We're not here to heal. We're here to get strong enough to serve. Okay? And that, uh, that's the real legacy of this work, is that we need to relearn how to trust, collaborate, partner with other men. We need to learn how to heal. We need to resurrect our father and redeem him from the underworld. We need to do all the work that you are doing. But we're doing that with the end of bringing the treasure home, being better fathers, better husbands, better business owners. That's the goal. So where do we get to this point? And I'm going to put on my anthropology hat for you for a little while. 
And I'd like to tell you a short story in which we are the main character. So it'll be interesting. So we are a species that was born in the savanna of Africa 300,000 years ago. Anatomically modern humans. And we were unsuccessful. We inherited controlled use of fire and the ability to make an Acheulean hand axe, which is a beautifully you know, cut two-bladed two tool. And we inherited that from Homo erectus, which was about a million years earlier. So these men in Africa had our same exact brains. They had our same exact bodies. And they invented and innovated nothing. They were low-level scavengers. So when you look at the fossil record, the big tooth marks of the apex predator is the first tooth mark on the bone. And then the scavenger marks are on top of the big cats. And then the vultures were on top of the scavengers. And then on top of the vulture marks is the longitudinal cut marks of us. That's where we were in the hierarchy is that bottom of the barrel, we had the ability to scrape the remnants off of what we needed, break some bones, get some marrow. And not only did we not innovate anything, we were almost extinct. And there were periods of time, particularly during the last big ice ages, where we were below 10,000 individuals on the planet. So things were bleak for us. And evolution is survival of the? Nope. Yeah. So erase the fittest conversation. That is one of the many lies that you have been told and you have been uh, indoctrinated with that if you can just get more disciplined and just get more followers and just get better abs, you will be successful. You will survive. And the truth is evolution is survival of the most. There you go. Adaptability. That's really what Darwin said. And that's the truth for individuals, for families, for organizations, for societies, and for species, adaptability is king. It means that you are not only able to survive, but you are able to take advantage of situations and thrive. Adaptability is king of this story. And so the gift of God, the gift of evolution is that we have the most adaptable brains that have ever been seen on the planet. Massive prefrontal cortex, self-awareness, neuroplasticity. We can learn, we can vision, abstract thought. It's remarkable, but it didn't work. Didn't work. We didn't invent anything with these big brains and we barely survived. And then we traveled out of Africa around 40,000 years ago into the Mideast, we pushed up across the Mediterranean into Europe. And at that time, Europe was faced with mile high looming glaciers, a thousand years of permafrost, giant new megafauna. And to make matters worse, it was already inhabited by another badass species of us that was bigger, stronger, cold adapted, had bigger brains than us, used the same tools, shit, the Neanderthals. And if you could choose between Homo sapien and Neanderthal on a video game, you choose Neanderthal all the time. That's the winning character. And, uh, so it's a death sentence for us. We're not competitive. We're not gonna be able to do it. And something magical happened at 35,000 years ago. Um, and it's referred to as our cognitive revolution. And if you, for those of you who are readers in the group, uh, the book Sapiens by Harari gives a nice little overview of that portion of human history. And it's a big mystery in um, you know, paleoanthropology. What happened? What the fuck happened to humans? because there's a point on the timeline where we see an explosion of symbolic thought, ritual burial, 
complex tools, musical instruments, game pieces. We see the full blossom of human culture happen in one moment on the timeline. So what happened? It's the big mystery. Um, if you, how many people watch Joe Rogan? We got some Joe Roganers. Well, if you're a Joe Rogan guy, and I do love Joe Rogan, um, he has the stoned ape hypothesis that somehow we wandered in some psilocybin and it rewired our brains. Some of y'all, you won't admit it, but you think the aliens came down. We got a little DNA. We got a little something, something from a monolith. Hey, could have happened. What we do know for a fact is that at that moment in time, we started to partner with our first animal ally. And that, that is this. So <clears throat> that's irrefutable. At 33,000 years ago in Siberia, you see snub-nosed wolves being buried with human children. So um, the wolf began its transformation into our dogs and we immediately leapfrogged the entire animal kingdom into apex predator. So what was really the download that we got from this? Because we did not domesticate the wolf. The wolf domesticated us. The wolf is the apex predator in the entire Northern Hemisphere. It has the widest range, it is the most adaptable, and it is the most successful predator in the entire Northern Hemisphere. So it's royalty. A wolf pack at full power rules its territory over anything. Cave bears, saber-toothed cats, Neanderthals. If a wolf pack wants a cave, it gets it. So that's royalty. We're low level scavengers. So we were graciously allowed into that kingdom. And there are a number of reasons why uh, that happened. Uh, we have a very similar kinship system. Uh, wolves operate with a very, very similar extended family hierarchy. Uh, it is focused around a single mating pair that mates for life. Uh, altruism is demonstrated. There's a, there's a vast amount of things, but there are four big lessons. And I want to share a couple with you tonight because we've lost these, okay? Um, and before I do the lessons, uh, let's get to where we are now. So Apex Predators, we traveled the globe with our new partner, and we basically ate about 80% of the megafauna on planet Earth into extinction. We are that good. That's why you're scared of each other is that we are lethal. We're, when we work together, we can have and do anything. And it was very successful until we invented agriculture, which was awesome because it allowed us to not have to migrate with the herds. It allowed us to grow enough food that we didn't have to forage and gather. We got to be stable. We got to build houses. We got to expand our families into communities. We got to expand those communities into villages, cities, and then nations. And that was seemingly a really, really good thing. And I wouldn't go back in time. However, we do have to honor and acknowledge the fact that we lost a precious thing. We lost the gift of the wolves at that time. Because we have been gifted what is known as an honor-based culture. An honor-based culture is tribe. It is kinship. It is your agreements that you shared in the field. That is all an honor-based culture. It's reciprocal, it's collaborative, it's safe, it's honest, it's transparent. It's all those things that make humanity work at an incredibly high level. And when we got large enough, that we expanded to over a hundred people. We could no longer maintain the intimacy of our relationships. 
And so our honor-based culture degraded into a pride-based culture. And that's what you were all born into. A pride-based culture is focused on the individual first. You are the most important thing in the world. Your life, your career, your experience, it's all about us. And what that's leading us to is an incredible spike in clinical anxiety because we're terrified of being alone. Clinical depression because we're incredibly sad that we have to be alone. Addiction rates. People are addicted because they lack belonging. That is the source of all addiction. And suicide, which is the ultimate response to a life without meaning. This is what we've inherited from this pride-based culture. Sounds like a death sentence, right? And that um, took, a, that stole one final piece from us, which is when we became a giant, sprawling, global species, we also lost initiation. We don't have a community of men who care enough about us and care enough about our collective future that they're willing to invest in us. And so we're forced to do that on our own. And that was my men's movement. There was a bunch of unprepared men trying to initiate unprepared men into a different operating system only because we knew that something was missing. And you know better. It's a very exciting time. Incredibly powerful to see men doing legitimate initiatory rite of passage work. And that in a nutshell is becoming a mature psychological man. And Kevin used a beautiful word, I decide, I decide. So the root of the word decide is C-I-D-E. It's the same root as homicide, suicide, insecticide. So in Latin, what does side mean? Yeah, it means cut or kill. So to be a man is someone who decides. We make those decisions. It's one of the agreements, the sacred. The sacred is something you're willing to sacrifice for. It all involves cutting and killing. Nothing is free. Men know that. And we make those decisions. We make those sacrifices to serve our people. That's tribe. That's initiation. It means you are willing to sacrifice the immediate gratification, the external validation, the currency of self for a greater currency, which is service, kingdom, meaning, purpose, significance. And that threshold can only be crossed with the support of other men. You cannot self-initiate, even though we've desperately tried, because no man can kill themselves, that the part of us that needs to die. We will always run from that. Viktor Frankl said, the, the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man, and who would willingly kill half their own heart? That's the initiation process. We need other bucket men to be able to guide us into the cave and they need to block the exits because we all run. That's what good men do. That's what our job this journey is, is to block the exits. Don't run, don't run. And if you experience yourself running or another man running, be there for him, right? Lovingly block the exits. So um, that's what we lost. And there is a means of reclaiming this. And uh, that, that's what I get the honor of uh, sharing with you men, is the lessons of the wolves and how to reclaim it. And the cool part about this is I'm giving this exact same fucking talk to Disney company. And the managers are going, wow, 
Yes, thank you, finally. <laughs> I, I get a lecture on the hero's journey. I get to sneak Iron John in, into the corporate space. Because what they want is they want to make money. And they make money by being competitive, innovative, resilient, you know, high retention rates for their key employees, full engagement with their workforce. Sounds a lot like kinship. So this is our time. This is the new operating system that makes people a lot of money, right? Down at the business school I work, um, you know, we do regular polls about what the, you know, the new breed MBAs want from the companies that they're going to apply for. And it's not money. That's in the top 10, but it's not the top of the list. It's not advantage or, um, you know, advancement. It's, it's not even prestige. What's the number one thing that young MBAs are looking for? Purpose. Purpose. Are the companies you're working for clear on a legitimate, authentic purpose that they are serving to the world? Sea change, people. And that's what we're here for, is to do that work. So it's a very exciting time. All this fucking gloom and doom about the planet's dying and humanity's dying and men are dying is exactly the opposite. That's the death throes of an old operating system, just desperately clinging to life. This is the new time. And the time of the lone wolf is over. And, and hey, to give credit where that's due, um, that is a, actually the last line of an old Hopi uh, poem. And it's actually a really beautiful poem. If you ever want to look it up, but it's got a strong finish. Like that last little line, like wham, lays that in there. But um, wolves run through our whole history. Um, uh, you know, the, my lineage has a lot of wolf stories. In one of the Choctaw legends, the you know, the great creator uh, saw that he really liked men. Like he, like, this is great. I think I did a great job with these dudes. I'm gonna make all the animals into men. And the first one he tried was the wolf. And he was only able to change the eyes of the wolf. They have our eyes. Um, they're yellow, a little more yellow, a little scarier, but um, they have our eyes. And what's interesting about that is we have their eyes. You know what, have you ever seen a picture of a primate, a gorilla, a chimp? What color are their sclera? That's the white of the eye. What color? Brown. Brown. Why brown? Safety. High contrast is seen by predators. So most animals, almost all, have the same color sclera as they do their pupil. Not wolves. Wolves have whites of their eyes. And they have developed this because it is a tremendous nonverbal communication skill that you can see what another wolf is looking at. We developed this from them within the last 35,000 years. All other primates have dark sclera. We have developed white sclera. We are living wolves who do not have weapons in our teeth, right, in our mouths, but we carry them. And when a wolf meets another wolf, they bow their heads in the same way that your dog, when he greets you, bows their head. And it's not, uh, it's not a sign that they want to be petted. It's a form of respect that is saying, I'm lowering my weapons. I'm not a threat to you. And this is the first big lesson of the wolves. So wolves kill things with their face. That's what they do for a living. And uh, they're one of the most efficient communal predators on, on, on the planet. Deadly. So how do you get a bunch of these deadly creatures to operate together? And this is a really important part. And my first time bringing um, a group of 
uh, veterans, combat vets, out to a wolf sanctuary, I thought was gonna be a really good idea because veterans are perceived as being dangerous, but they're actually just trying to get by. People generally don't talk to veterans about their experience because they don't wanna hear it. And so wolves are very similar. There's a mythology around wolves that they're big and bad and they eat old women and children. And the truth is they don't. There's only been two uh, confirmed deaths by wolf in the history of North America. There's about 200 people that die every year with cows. <laughs> so wolves don't eat people, they're terrified of people. And yet there's a mythology around wolves in the same way there's a mythology around combat vets or gang members or other, other men who are marginalized because they have undertaken violence as a career. They're, they're people who have the capability of violence. They're not violent people. So I brought a van load of veterans out and there was a couple wolf handlers with some wolves to come greet us. And we opened the van door and we're all getting out. And these two big males lock up in this ferocious fight right in front of the van. I'm like, fuck. That's the last thing I wanted to see. And when wolves fight, they stand up on their back legs. They're about as tall as I am. Spit flies everywhere. Um, huge teeth. Like, I mean, it's a terrifying spectacle. Like, it's an ancient, terrifying thing. And I thought, hey, uh, these handlers, you need to break this up. And they were like, just, they were leaning against a tree just saying, no, man, that's just what they do. And I said, that's just what they do. He goes, yeah, they're, they're pack hunters. They can't afford to bite each other. So they never do. So let that sink in for a minute. So when you are part of a tribe, a family, a team, that you need each other, it's interdependent, it's reciprocal, it's a sports team, it's a military unit, it's a family. When you need those men, you cannot afford to bite them because biting them is like biting yourself. So wolves fight, but they don't bite. We need this back in our world. That's the honesty the authenticity. If, if you are wanting that in your life, you have to be able to fight. You have to be able to move your requests, whether it's your boss or your woman or your kids, you have to move those requests to requirements. That means you're gonna be doing some fighting. And we have lost the ability for healthy conflict in our society because it's a taboo, right? And I'd like to propose to you that the opposite of conflict is not peace. The opposite of conflict is creation. So we need it. We need to be able to engage with healthy conflict if we're going to be able to be honest and authentic and get our needs met. So that was the first lesson, which brings me to the second lesson which is that only works if we are aligned. If we are part of something that is greater than ourselves. And I'd like to introduce you to a, an ancient African word, Ubuntu. Everybody say that, please. Ubuntu. Um, some of you guys, the smart guys in the group, you may know this as an operating system. <laughs> Ubuntu operating system. Mm. It's, a, it's actually a, an ancient African word. And it's one of these rare words that means the same thing from Northern Africa through 10,000 different tribal dialects uh, down to South Africa. And Ubuntu means the same thing. It's a really cool term. Um, we have a similar one here in North, Central, and South America, which is Temescal, sweat lodge. It's that important to us, right? the ritual of reintegration and purification that we only do through sweating together, that's universal in humanity to the point where we have one word, temescal, wherever you go. So Ubuntu is the African similar version, except what it means is 
I am because we are. And we are because I am. And it's short for humanity. And I'd like to just say that again so you guys can lock in on that. I am because we are. Without you, I do not exist. I'm not here tonight without you. But you are because I am. What you are all bringing individually with your personal history, your gold, your shadows, your humanity is what makes this work. It's the two sides of the same coin of humanity. It's a beautiful concept. And we've forgotten that second half that we are. That we are part is kinship. And it doesn't exist in our pride-based world outside of a few little centralized pockets that are the remnants of our honor-based culture. How many men here played team sports growing up? Um, for most of you, that was the best team you were ever on. I'll throw it out there. When you review back, like in my life, when did I feel the most connected to another group of men? Oh yeah, when we were playing sports. So sports, the military, there's a few other little bastions of honor-based culture in our society. And uh, that's really what has kept this whole movement alive, is those men who are willing to teach the younger men that what you're doing, no matter what it is, however small, contains the seeds of how you do the big things in your life, however big. It's a universal connection that is missing in our society where there's no consequence. We don't see it until very later we realize we've made terrible mistakes, but not with sports. So those are the last remaining vestiges of our honor-based culture. And so your job as a member of a giant sea of lone wolves is to find ways to create that alignment or that affiliation. And that's your first step. You don't even get to jump ahead to abundance, success, authenticity. You can't afford to do that. Because if you go back home right now with all of your authenticity weapons super sharp and you're open-hearted and you're honest and you're speaking your truth, how are people gonna to respond to that? Yeah, they're not here. They're not doing the work. They're going to interpret that as shame. Oh, you're shaming me. Because shame is the pride-based version of accountability. When we're honest, when we're holding each other accountable, when we're speaking our truth, when we are living our highest selves, when we're making our requirements about what our needs are, that only exists in the safe confines of honor. Otherwise, it will be interpreted poorly. So your job is you need to build your alignment first. And there's a couple ways of doing that. Um, I'll, I'll share with you three kind of big pillars of creating alignment. The first one is that you need to have a shared why. Why does your team exist? Why does your family exist? Why does it, a partnership exist? And there's probably an immediate answer of money, fulfilling a job. There's some sort of an immediate answer for all of us. And then ask why to that answer, right? Well, I need to make money because I need to pay the bills. Why? And then ask why four or five more times and you will have excavated down to a truth that is legitimate and real. It'll be aspirational, it will be inspirational, and it will have something to do with the service of other people. No matter what it is, your job as a leader who is building alignment with another group of people, and this is with your family, this is with your work team, is that you need to be able to supply a shared vision for the future. It is a future that does not currently exist. We're desperate for that. 
Napoleon says that a leader is a dealer in hope. We need to be that. Most of the men in this world are not getting to do this. We need to be dealers in hope. That is your shared vision. And that's the first thing you need to supply. Because without it, you are traveling through the desert with nothing to guide you. And I, I got to share this with a couple men today and I, I wanted to um, share it with most of you because it struck me as particularly profound for us on this journey. And this is the sacred sun journey. And that is uh, in, in the Torah, Old Testament, the Jews are liberated from tyranny and slavery. That's why you're here, to become liberated from tyranny and slavery. It's probably an internal journey as well, more than anything else. But that's the theme of the story. That's why you're here. And then, once the Jews were released from bondage, they headed off to the Promised Land, because that's what you get when you are free of tyranny and slavery. But that's not how the story goes. Before those Israelites got to Israel, what did they have to go through? How long? 40 years. I think we're actually at a Jewish camp, are we not? We are? are? There you go. Lachaim. Baruch Hashem. So there's a little missing piece of the hero's journey that once the hero goes into the cave and meets himself and realizes that under the dark helmet is the dark father and that we're terrified of either his weakness, his tyranny, or his absenteeism, that's us. We're really afraid of that. And we're here to get liberated from that. And that's a beautiful thing. That is the healing process. And then we get to go home to our garden, the promised land. Not so fast. You got some time in the desert. And that is the time that is bleak. It's unforgiving. You're going to take a couple steps up the sand dune and be right back where you started. And that is what turned most of those Israelites around. So they got through the desert by following a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's your vision. That's the vision. And it has to guide you through some challenging times. They are eminent. Your troubles are doing nothing but getting stronger right now. You think you're going back to an easier marriage? Going back to a better job? Fixed government? I don't know. Nope. No. You're going back to slog through the desert. And if you do not have a strong pillar of why you are doing this, then you will turn around back into tyranny and slavery. So that's your vision. It's why that is important. But it's not enough. It's aspirational, but it's not real. That's something far off in the future. We use it for navigating. But most of our travel is not navigating. Navigation is looking at the map. Looking at the map doesn't get you anywhere. It's like reading a cookbook. You starve to death. (laughs) There's a lot of people starving here reading cookbooks in the men's movement. At some point, you better get fucking cooking. (laughs) And that's route finding, right? Look at the map. Okay, I'm looking, I'm going the right direction. And then you have to chart your course. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have to deviate to go up this little path. There's a big wall right there. I'm gonna have to go this way and go through the opening. That's route finding, that's life. You're traveling through the desert, right? Look at the map and when you need to. Recommit to your vision. Have your family recommit to the vision. But the route finding requires some practical tools. And so at some point when his people were giving up, what did Moses do? Gave them rules. 
There you go. Went up the mountain, right? And he received the commandments. And those commandments were the way to navigate the journey. That's the how. Your vision is your why. Your values are your how. How are you going to conduct yourself when you get back home? What's different? Values are the way that we navigate deciding what lives and what dies. What is sacred enough that I will sacrifice for it? These are man questions. These are the big questions of masculinity. Whatever you choose to be or do or have will come at a cost. So figure out what it is you really want. Figure out the price. Fucking pay it. That's sacrifice for the sacred. It's not free. So that's the thing that enables you to get through the desert. That's your values. That's your shared vision. And then the last piece is your shared mission. And a shared mission is what are you working on? It's incredibly important. Lead with it. A great question to ask another, another man here this weekend. What are you building? Ask them that. What are you building? Because that's our birthright. We're the builders. We built the world. Men built the world. We also destroyed it. So you get to own both sides of that. We are in the process of destroying the world, but never forget that we built it. We are the builders. So what are you building? That's your mission. And the big components of a shared mission that make it work, and this is for your life partners when you go home and your work partners when you re-engage with that, is it needs to be transparent. We need to share. That's the honesty piece. I'm really proud of what I've done. You know, celebrate, receive validation. But you also need to be honest about where you're struggling. I'm failing at social media. <laughs> Adam busted my balls recently. Um, there are things that we're failing at and we need to be transparent about that too. Because the ability to celebrate right, and share struggles is really where collaboration comes in. This is Ubuntu. This is where we get to hunt big game. You do not hunt big game by yourself. It's another one of the wolf lessons, right? There is no such thing as a lone wolf. I see a lot of guys at the gym with a lone wolf shirt because it's really cool. <laughs> Anybody here got a lone wolf shirt? Maybe. I'm a lone wolf. Well, you're a scavenger. You're starving to death and you're dying a very ignoble and quick death. That's the, desti that's the destiny of a lone wolf. And it's the destiny of a lone man. You are a scavenger, you're starving, and you have a shorter life, right? Number one driver of um, not only health, but happiness, and this is a big longitude, a hundred year longitudinal study from Harvard, um, is not about lifestyle, it's not about um, spiritual practice. The number one driver of health and happiness is relationships. Number one, it's irrefutable. Lone wolves do not fail well and neither do lone humans. We need each other. And so if we can't collaborate because there's not opportunities to, we're not safe enough, we don't have a shared vision for the future, then we will fall apart and degrade into lone wolves. So collaboration, it can only happen from transparency. And collaboration drives the engine of kinship. And this is called reciprocity. When a man has done something nice for me, I feel honor bound to return that. That's reciprocity. 
and it is uh, the birthright of men is to be able to be honored for our service and to be able to provide that service and kind of the the little secret slogan that I live my life by and you're welcome to share this or steal it is uh, I live my life in service and I'm compensated for it in every way so if you're looking for a a pillar of smoke by day it's a pretty good one so those are the three um, big foundational components of alignment so when you get back be thinking about what is your vision for your family what is your vision for your job share it and you're not going to be able to do this unless you write and speak we've lost a lot of that make sure that you are writing do some journaling and most importantly speak this weekend All right and if you're somebody who does a lot of speaking allow space for other men to speak it's incredibly important we create with our words the word abracadabra another hebrew word right what does it mean abracadabra I create what I speak. <laughs> Powerful. And it's true. Um, the men that I've talked to that I appreciate deeply and I'm grateful to see, um, and I shared that with them, their, their blood chemistry is different. Just from, I made noises out of my mouth that changed their blood chemistry. You know, mm, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, you change the world with the words you speak. When you use hateful, inauthentic, or dishonest words, then you're creating a different spell. Spelling is the act of writing. So writing and speaking, that's also a birthright of men. Incredibly important. So <clears throat> once we have established that foundation, there is a switch that happens in men, is that if I share one of those three things, we have a group. A group is cool. It's better than a lone wolf. If I share two of those foundational components, I have a team. A team is way more powerful than a group. Vastly more cohesive, resilient, and successful. And then if I share all three, I have a tribe. I have a kinship system, I have an honor-based culture, and that's when the magic happens, because you are no longer the other. You are no longer just another man who's going to a men's work conference. You are me, and we are attending this thing together. We have become something greater than the sum of its parts. That's when Ubuntu happens. So that's when kinship happens. So it's not magical, although it is magical. It's something that you can create. Because what I just shared with you is what every single coach does in the world. Every spring training. Bunch of lone wolves show up. They all want playing time. They all want scoring. And they have to go, oh, I have to kill that operating system and reinstall. Nope. We're not here for your playing time. We're here for what? We're, we're here for the, that big trophy at the end of the year. We're here for championship. We're here for significance. Nobody remembers who won the scoring title. Everyone remembers who won the championship. That's big game. It doesn't happen with a bunch of lone wolves. It only happens with something that is cohesive and aligned. So once we've established that kinship system, then of course you have to recommit to it regularly because it's a sandcastle. We are born into an era of multiple, multiple, multiple generations of pride-based culture, of men who are raised without initiation. And their fathers, your fathers were not initiated and your grandfather was not initiated. So we were being raised by boys and we still have a boy operating system that feels like we get certain things, we deserve certain things. 
I deserve unconditional love. The only one you're getting unconditional love from is your mom. I love my mom. But um, men, our love is conditional. And we provide a service to the world. It's the way it operates. We are here to protect and provide something to the world. And that's a very, very heavy burden. That's why a lot of men don't get through the desert because that's what it is, is our job is to get our people through the desert. It's unforgiving and don't expect to be validated. Don't expect to be rewarded. The desert exists to test the faithful. And that's, that's what we sign up for as initiated men, is that you will not be acknowledged a lot of the time for the work you're doing. But you need to acknowledge each other. That's what men do. We need validation from other men. We need to be seen, we need to be witnessed, and it's central to the initiation process. It's also central to the reintegration process. And I'd like to spend a couple minutes uh, to share this with you, that you're going to be reintegrating back into your world. This is the special world, right? You, you, you left your jobs and your families and your normal life, and you have entered the special world of the hero's journey. And there's chaos and uncertainty. Uh, there are, there's elder wisdom, there are allies. There's gonna be supernatural aid the, the, the magical synergy of the people that are in your group were exactly what they're supposed to be. We're all being moved by helping hands this weekend. And you're gonna have to go home again. And that's gonna be challenging, right? This is the reintegration process. And, and there are many men who are lost in this. We're never able to come home. Because part of this journey is that we go off to war every day. You know, your job, that means you have to do things you don't want to do that are potentially out of alignment with you. You're dealing with the anxiety of money, meaning. Uh, it's incredibly adverse, the world that we step back into. And so the ability to come home again involve some sort of a ritual. We need to be reintegrated. And um, this is, used to be the purview of veteran only conversations, right? Or maybe an athlete who's retiring, is that how do I come home again when I have learned to put on a certain amount of armor to exist in the world? You can't be so sensitive in the world that it stops your mission. You have to take some hits, right? To be able to provide a service. And that's part of masculinity. Um, we all have a warrior archetype that we have to step into to be able to do the challenging things that are required from us. The things that potentially our, our wives and children do not do. And so we armor up and we lock it down we don't express, right? we don't share, we don't feel because it's too dangerous out there in the world to do that. So we're guarded, we're armored, and at some point, if we're not careful, then we become the monsters we're fighting. We become so good at wearing armor that it becomes our identity and then we don't feel anymore. And we don't appreciate anymore. Because when you're wearing armor, hard to hug your kids. Very hard to even appreciate a sunset through a visor. So the ability to go home again, to take the armor off, uh, is something that is encoded in every single culture that we've ever studied. Every indigenous culture has a battle-tested process of bringing their men home. 
from a, a hunt, you know, a dispute, some sort of a challenge. And it involves purification. Uh, because when we engage with conflict, when we go out into the world and we do the things that we have to do, we take on debris. It's like oil in an engine. We have a certain amount of mana, mojo, life force. And when that's running through a hot engine in combat, in a career, in traffic, in a high stress world where you have to be around strangers all the time, you're taking on debris. And that oil turns very dark and very sludgy and very corrosive. So the process of reintegrating involves purification. And I love seeing so many men barefoot here tonight. That's, that's part of purification, right? Sweat lodge, that's a purification ritual. Taking a shower is a purification. Playing with a dog, that's a direct purification serotonin boost. So finding some way that is ritualistic is the way that we are able to reclaim our human beingness and not just our human doingness. So when I say that men are valued by the value they provide, it's our job to make that meaningful and sustainable. And that involves resiliency. So that is an aspect of kinship as well. All of this work of purification and reintegration cannot be done alone. It always requires the witness of other men. And so you didn't go into the sweat lodge by yourself. You went in there with the elders. They held space for you. They actually carried your trauma. So you don't have to carry it all. All the shit that you experience every day that you're carrying, those boulders in your backpack, other men can help with that. I hear you, I see you, I absolve you, I bless you. Because there's a big difference between guilt and shame. And I talked about shame earlier as a, it's a pride-based version of accountability. Shame is not something that you ever get rid of. When you feel ashamed because you're not making enough money or you don't have a certain car or followers, whatever the thing is that validates you, um, there's shame involved and it's crippling. And the only way that we get rid of shame is we speak it and we get absolved by other men. And you might have to do that work with your dad. Your dad did the best he could with what he had. He did not have sacred sons. So the ability to be able to absolve our ancestral shame, right? That's the ancestral curse that we received from our fathers that he took on from his father. Those are the ancestors. And the end of every hero's journey for a man is ultimately down to really two simple things. What we all really want when we excavate down through the whys, we all want freedom and we all want meaning. Life for men, and this is very different than the heroine's journey. The hero's journey is a very different animal. We are here for freedom and meaning, and we break ancestral curses. Women heal ancestral wounds. It's a very different psychological end game for them, and it's a very different journey. Same stages, right? But very different themes. So don't lose sight of that pillar of smoke, which is what you're really here for, is to do the, to do the work so that you can get free and pursue meaning. That's the end of our goal, because if you can do it, you have resurrected your father. You have redeemed him from the underworld. You have broken the ancestral curse. It's the most noble thing that we can do. How many dads do we have? Yeah, that's our job. Because if you don't do it, then they have to. Kevin shared that earlier. It's really beautiful. We're here to do the work so they don't have to. They get to face more exalted things, right? And they get to fail in their own journey. So 
uh, back to the wolves. So the the wolves have a uh, a way of taking care of each other, which is profound, um, and it's one of the big lessons that allows us to do this work. And it involves altruism and the ability to recognize that uh, we're not just here for ourselves. We're, we're here for each other. It's a bigger game, right? And Joseph Campbell says about the hero's journey that we're, we're not on this journey to save the world. We're on this journey to save ourselves, but in doing so, we end up saving the world because the influence of a vital man vitalizes. I'll say that again. The influence of a vital man vitalizes. So we're here to do our work, but we're also here to do the work for each other. And this means that you may have to join another man where he is. That's the acceptance piece. That's the Sacred Sons acceptance agreement. You have to meet them where they are. It might be hard. There might be some healthy conflict in that, involved in that. But when we look back at um, the fossil record again, there's some great lessons in there. And the famous uh, anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked at a conference once, what's the oldest example of human culture? What do you think? Okay, it's not pottery, fire, tools. It's healed, broken bones. Okay? Um, if you break your leg in the wilderness by yourself, you die. If you have a tribe, you survive and you get to continue serving the tribe. This is altruism. In the fossil record, if you see a break, it's why the animal died. Humans and wolves, very different. Almost universally, we have healed broken bones. It is um, one of the big lessons of the wolves is that um, something had to happen. There were sacrifices for the sacred of the collective that needed to have happened. It's not free to take care of a wounded wolf or a wounded friend. You have to sacrifice some of your time, your resources, your energy, and we all sacrifice to be here. So make sure that this is serving your brothers as well. Because if you can heal a bone correctly, it's stronger than it was before. Be grateful for your breaks. It's the place that lets the light in. And that's the inspiration. So fight, don't bite. The time of the lone wolf is over. And altruism. These are the three wolf west, uh, wisdoms that we covered tonight. And uh, the time flew by. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. So, hey, I want to leave with a blessing because we're in a Jewish camp. Um, this blessing came from Rabbi Hillel from almost 2,500 years ago. Rabbi Hillel the Elder. Three-part blessing. If you are not for yourself, then who will be? If you are not for others, then what are you? And if not now, right? So to unpack that briefly, um, you need to take care of yourselves. That's why, you know, that that's, needs to happen. Self-care. It's not selfish. You need to kill that operating system. Self-care is not selfish. You need to do it. Because if you go down and you're broken, break, broken, you cannot serve others. You also need to hold your vision why you're here what you want out of your life, it's precious. If you don't hold that, nobody else will. So that's a precious pillar that you need to keep lit in the horizon. You need to serve others. If you are not in service of others, then what are you, right? That's the end of this journey, is we need to serve others. That's the source of our meaning and our freedom. And then lastly, if you're waiting, if you're waiting for um, validation, permission, if you're waiting to when you finally feel like you're ready, when you finally feel like you're enough, then your life will start. You wait forever. Okay? So it's now. It's this weekend. 
Like you need to do the work now. If it's quitting smoking, if it's the, let, let that be the first step of many. Like this information does nothing for you. This retreat will do nothing for you. No program, no book, no self-help course were ever going to liberate you. You are the one that will liberate you. You need to do this and it needs to start now. Not with something at the end of this. It's how you behave now. So cross the threshold immediately. And that's the blessing from Rabbi Hillel. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. I'll be around. Okay. Oh, you did great, brother. Oh, oh, oh. Love you, man. Okay, I love you, man. All right.